I learned the valuable, important lesson of asking my players questions as opposed to telling them what I saw. As coaches, we love to tell our teams everything. You did this wrong. You did great here. We didn't do this. Um, we should have done that. Like, why? So what our focus is, is we really have coaches shift their model. Hey guys, I'm here with Justin Fleming and get ready to hear an amazing story of a man who has found his passion, found his purpose, and we're going to learn some lessons about how coaching athletes translates into life, leadership, family, and business. Check it out. Justin Fleming, welcome to the show. It's good to see you, Matt. Thanks so, for having me. Thanks for being here. I was talking to Joey offline. Yeah. Uh, this is the first guest. You're the first guest I've had. We just met today. Absolutely. Mutual friend. Got connected through JB. Yeah. Justin Bowling. Awesome guy. He His is. episode was just out a couple months ago. Yeah. Love it. So, you know, this, this show, um, I was reflecting uh, on, we're about halfway through a season, halfway through a, a full year at the time of recording and just going back to hear stories of different business owners, business yeah. leaders, people that are in a position of influence in the community and, and their world. Yeah. Um, and it's like, man, we've got stories of overcoming adversity, mm -hmm. starting businesses, great content for men, people that have totally changed their life around. Yeah. Uh, people that are sharing their passions. We've literally had coffee together for 10 minutes. We're both super jacked up. Yeah. But I'm really pumped to hear about just your, your story just as a, as a man and, and my performer and how that started. And you've got some really awesome stuff going on. Oh well, yeah. I'm appreciate that, man. I, uh, my journey has been kind of surreal when I, I think about it and look back on it. Um, there's a famous quote that I always love, uh, which is, you can never connect the dots looking forward, uh, but only looking backwards. And so I kind of look at my my life. I'm, I'm 38 years old. And um, it's just sort of one of those things, man, to where you look back and you reflect uh, just really, to be quite honest, just how good God's been <laughs> to bring yes. you where you are present day. Yeah. You know, um, I'd say, gosh, my story I, I don't want to take it all the way back to like, you know, being birthed, but I really think that uh, my story, quite honestly, be began for me as an adult when I moved out to Colorado. Um, I was originally born on the East Coast, um, product of the DMV. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with that, that's D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Okay. See, I'm Jersey. Okay. So I was my 10. Man, my man. Yeah. I love that. Look at this. I love We're that. We're long lost friends, man. I already, know. I already know where this is going to go. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm a transplant, but, you know, I haven't been here since 2006. I feel like a local. Yeah. Um, and so um, I transferred uh, to Colorado State University in 2006. Uh, I came from Frostburg State University uh, out on the East Coast in Western Maryland. And um, I did about a year and a half of my undergrad there. And um, it's just got a stirring uh, that there was more for me and more out there. I can literally remember writing a two-page email to my parents that said, um, you know, in short and summary, mom, dad, um, I really want to grow up, spread my wings, and figure out what it is that God has for me. And I knew just intuitively that I couldn't do that living in the nest, so to speak. And the nest for me was, was the DMV. Okay. Um, and so I took a semester off and I applied to probably about 13 different schools all across the country. And CSU happened to be one of those. Ended up coming out here uh, simply because uh, two reasons. Number one, I wanted to continue my education, hence transferring to CSU. Yeah. And then number two, at the time, I was uh, dating a young lady uh, who actually lived in Montana. So it was like a way to be closer to her um, and as well, you know, kind of work on me. Yeah. Um, I knew, I, matter of fact, I'd even got, gotten an acceptance to University of Montana in Missoula, uh, but did not go because I said if I moved to a state for a specific person— that might derail me. 
Yeah. So that wasn't the driver. She, it was true. Number two. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, I was, I was wondering, I was like, Hmm. Yeah. 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 You sure. For okay. sure. All for right. sure. So, um, I came out, I didn't know a single soul. Um, and 2006, that was the day and age of MySpace. And, um, I ended up meeting a friend, um, and she happened to be from DC. Um, not the young lady I was dating. Okay. Um, but she connected me to like my first friends here in Fort Collins, good friends of mine, uh, Brian, Cedric. Um, and so <clears throat> came out here with literally $649 to my name and the rest is history. And, um, you know, I, I went through a period of time being in school, the parties, um, the, the illicit, uh, lifestyle, shall we say. And, um, I, I ended up getting off track again and it came to a head in August of 2007. So I actually had to pack up, put all my stuff in storage, had two dogs at the time, flew back to uh, Maryland, stayed with my folks for about two weeks. And I was like, yeah, this isn't it. Um, I ended up moving to Virginia, um, stayed in my father's childhood home. Uh, my aunt happened to be retired and was living in that house. Um, but it was perfect, perfect setup, had a fenced in yard. So had a place for the dogs to be. And, um, I took those four months, September through December of 2007 to get my head screwed back on straight because like it, it, I had completely fallen apart, um, partying, drinking drugs, yeah. the girls, all of it. Um, and I had forgotten what my original purpose was in coming out here. So that, so you spent your first year, right? Oh, six into oh, seven, mm-hmm. first year at CSU. Yep. Out of the nest. First yep. time, mm-hmm. new area. And, and those, the drugs, the drink and the women, right? They all seem, it's like the trifecta. It they is. They all kind of hit you. One, one usually hits you first and then the other, that, that's what happened for me. I was yeah. CSU 99 to 03. Okay. And same, same kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. But you, you realized that though. So was there a moment when you realized that, was there just this moment of, of clarity or particular experience where you decided to pack it up to go back? I want to say that moment really occurred when, so in January of 2007, my girlfriend that lived in Montana, that was from Montana, moved down here. Um, and... We had a six-month lease, and that relationship fell apart. I was still very young, immature, um, had no real sense of direction and purpose at that point, and um, it ended up being the demise of that relationship. And I can remember the day that her father drove down from Montana with a trailer packed up all her stuff. We said goodbye and I had to be out of that place within a week. And, um, I moved into a house with some buddies of mine. Um, and that was where I spiraled that summer, all of July and the first couple of weeks of August. And, um, I was like, yeah, something, something different's got to happen here. Um, and so I moved back. So <clears throat> going back, fast forward into the end of that year, um, I, you know, was working retail, but I was taking a lot of time to journal and like, what is it that I want? What do I think God's calling me towards? And he didn't really reveal that until the next year. So I moved back to Colorado in uh, January 2008. And um, 2008 was kind of where things really began to shift. Um, So 
So a couple of things happened. Uh, I met my basketball mentor later that year. But prior to that, ended up getting a DUI. <laughs> uh. Uh, well, DWAI. Um, all the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, I fell right back into it, partying again. And that summer, uh, ended up in some legal troubles. And yeah, it, it was kind of like that, that same cycle that I saw starting to happen again. And so I have sickle cell anemia. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like having that blood disorder, uh, for those that don't know, sickle cell anemia is a, um, I call it a disorder, disease, um, to where um, many of your red blood cells are sickle shaped. Um, and because of that, due to lack of oxygenation, uh, due to extreme temperatures, um, mainly the cold, um, or <clears throat> due to lack of hydration, uh, it causes these pain episodes, most excruciating pain. So if you can imagine, you've hung a picture before, right? Yeah. Winding up that hammer and hitting your finger. Imagine that repetitively time and time and time over. Uh, and so when those those crises happen, they call them sickle cell crises, um, there's really only a few things you can do, which is um, either wait it out if you've got the medication to treat yourself at home or you've got to go into the hospital. Uh, ER, emergency department, one of the two. Um, and um, it it's just time. Uh, at that point, they normally hook me up to oxygen, uh, put me on uh, IV pain medication and fluids. Um, and so I can remember a cycle starting in late of that year. Um, and so <clears throat> fast forward, I was serving at Texas Roadhouse. Um, my old boss, great guy, Jimmy Dolan, uh, he connected me and uh, my mentor, who was uh, Rob Lewis, um, and God rest his soul. Uh, Rob passed away uh, last year um, due to sickle cell anemia, and I believe he had complications from COVID as well. Okay. Um, and so sort of one of those things to where um, the intersection of our lives uh, really started to shape and form me as a man. Um, and not only that, what he brought me into, which was coaching basketball, um, really started to impact my life in a way that I couldn't have imagined. Um, had you asked me when I was eight, nine, ten years old, what do you want to be when you grow up? Basketball coach was like the farthest thing that I would have, I would, would never have said that. What did you want to be? What did you say? Um, you can ask my mom to this day. I wanted to be president. I don't think that meant president of the free world. Okay. I've never been a man for politics. Um, <laughs> funny thing, though, a good buddy of mine, he always jokes with me and says uh, that I'm the mayor <laughs> because I seem to know everyone yeah, or everyone yeah. knows me, wh whichever that that uh, equates to. And so... <clears throat> But going back to uh, coaching hoops, um, being pulled into that environment, that started out as something that filled a lot of my free time, my spare time, and quickly evolved into something that I absolutely loved. Um, whenever you, you find something that you just feel is intuitively you, you latch on to it. And um, so I, I always tell people my, my coaching career, I feel like started in 2008. Um, and um, it was, I, I don't even think that I was coaching. I was just like on the sidelines, you know? Did you, did you play growing up? I played middle school um, and a lot of rec stuff uh, throughout high school because I went to a small private Christian school and, you know, my graduating class was 13. So you can imagine how 
what the lack of our sports program looked like. So a lot of what I did came from rec or really just enjoying going to the court. Like back when I was growing up, like street ball was a thing, man, you know? Um, and it was more so for like uh, bragging rights and knowing like who the best guys were at your neighborhood court. Yeah. Um, and I grew up in PG, PG County. Um, at, which has churned out a lot of basketball products. Um, and, but I, I will tell you, playing sports was never anything that I aspired to. So my parents never pushed me hard in that direction. They gave my siblings and I a, 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 the opportunity to grow into whatever paths it was that we chose. And, um, <clears throat> that's why, you know, I always tell people coaching found me. Um, but when it did, uh, I, I haven't let it go since. Uh, and so it's something that I, I plan to do for as, as long as I possibly can until I'm old and gray. Love that. And then yeah. we were, we were talking downstairs before you know, firing up the coffee. You shared something really, really interesting is, um, you talked about injuries happen in sports and mm-hmm. competitive natures and there's the physical injury yeah but then there's the whole psychological component absolutely. and process that happens with that athlete absolutely um, and i'm thinking back some brazilian jiu-jitsu is my my sport com- competed you know at the local level yeah. uh, but lots of injuries man I've, I'm, I'm pretty broken at 42 <laughs> but i just think about those the physical injury but then what was going on at the time yeah and, and how that would prevent or fuel or not fuel or sidetrack getting, getting back on the mats. Yeah. I'm in an interesting space now. Cause I'm sitting here now. Like, I don't know that I can train mm. anymore with some of the injuries I've got mm. right now. Every time I get back out there, I get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, talk about that because your, your business deals with that mm-hmm. and definitely want to transition into, into that story. Yeah. How did you get from not knowing you wanted to do sports? You meet this mentor, you start coaching yeah. and now you've got a company. You're getting ready to go do a European tour. Well, that's that's planned and slated for for next year, twenty twenty five. Just simply because of all the contacts and what that we've, um, you know, created over the years, um, and and really that's that's just rapport and and relationship building, um, especially knowing with the end goal in mind of wanting to be a platform that that, um, you know, caters to a global athletic audience um that's that's it's just a a a necessity um so you know when i think about sports um and having coach now for the short time that i have uh, i'm still green and wet beyond behind the ears in comparison to a lot of the coaches that i look up to uh and that i glean from um i think you know, just as much that sports is a physical um, uh, <clears throat> aspect, S- sports revolves heavily around uh, your mentality and your mindset. Um, I'm thinking of a quote that says sports um, reveals character. Um but I think the biggest thing is, is that anyone who's ever played sports or been an athlete will tell you the physical side is is the um, the the lesser side of it. It's the the mental side that all the great athletes learn how to um, attach themselves to and really understand what it means to to mold and shape that. <clears throat> and so my performa grew out of my coaching experience. Um, I started the company um, really uh, with a set of peers because we were all coaching at the same time. Um, I may have spearheaded it just to, you know, get the company up and going off the ground, but it's never been anything that I've done by myself. Um, 
I, you know, kind of my, my path has been starting out with uh, the younger age levels, middle school, fifth through eighth. Um, and I did that from about 2000 and uh, all the way up, up until 2012. Um, coached at Kennard Middle School, coached for, uh, at the time, Rob had a uh, club organization, Northern Colorado Rage. And moving from there, um, I went to Heritage Christian Academy. Um, had an awesome opportunity to, to coach under Kevin McGinley, uh, affectionately known as PK to a lot that uh, many that know him. Uh, he uh, is the uh, pastor over at Southgate. And um, I really look at that time, 2015 to uh, 2012 to 2015. Um, PK gave me my first shot. Um, head coach of middle school, uh, JV coach, and uh, his assistant at the varsity level. And it's really, really interesting because my final year there, 2014, that year, um, you know, I was going through a lot personally and really trying to uh, figure out um, if I've never achieved a or or ascertained a, 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 a level of play meaning at the collegiate level but yet I coach athletes who desire to be there how do I develop them into their best selves so that they can actually make it there um, and I will tell you, that's probably the story for a lot of coaches, because just when you think about the numbers, the top less than 1% make it to the league, as we call it, if we're talking about basketball. Um, there's about 9 million, 9 to 10 million high school athletes in the U.S., um, and then you bump up to the collegiate space, there's about 489, I think it's probably surpassed about 500K now. It might be like right around 512,000 collegiate athletes. Um, and then when you think about, um, uh, you know, national teams um, and, you know, playing for at the Olympic level, there's maybe like less than 200 Olympic athletes. Um so when you factor all of that in, and let's even just take it back to basketball, you know, for kids that are aspiring to play pro, I was listening to a video uh, this past week. You know, you you got guys that are essentially competing for like thirty some spots at the pro level, and half of that, maybe half of that get an opportunity and a chance to play, uh, to start and play for four years. So like when you think about like just the magnitude of that, um, but then even at the youth level, how parents are trying to specialize their kid so early to achieve something that is maybe only going to last this, this much of their life. What else What else are you shooting for past that? Because your career is going to end. And when your career ends, what do you want to be known for? Your stat column or who you were as a person? A big shout out and thank you to one of our sponsors, M&D Painting and Roofing. M&D was actually founded by my wife, Emily, and I back in 2005. And for the last two decades, we've been here in northern Colorado of one of the leaders in residential and commercial repainting, as well as most recently installing residential roofs. So if you need to paint, re-roof, you got hit by a hailstorm, we can take care of whatever your home needs from top to bottom. You can find us on the web at mandepainting.com. Hey, just want to give a big shout out to one of our sponsors, Imprint Digital. If you're a small business owner, one of the things that you need to navigate to be successful is all things online and digital in terms of marketing and your messaging. Imprint Digital, they're the real deal. They are the professionals and they know this world inside and out. Make sure to visit their website at imprint-digital.com. So my performa, circling back around to that, really shines a light 
on helping to develop athletes based upon who they are. Um, I love coaching simply because of the bonds and the connections that I get, the relationships that I get to form with all of my guys. And being able to see them develop into young men and family men is so much more rewarding than watching, you know, a 40 minute game on TV. Because again, that's such a short span of time. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm elated (laughs) when it happens, you know, and especially getting, being, having an opportunity and a chance to go and see that game in person. Right. Um, But because I've been kind of doing this as long as I have, I've had the opportunity to see guys that I, I coached back in high school, graduate college, get married, having kids. (laughs) <laughs> um, that's our job as coaches to teach these young athletes um, how to be contributing members of society um, and hopefully whatever gems or um, nuggets that I drop in practice you know, we only as coaches get an opportunity and a chance to see the dividends of that years down the line. It doesn't show itself right away. And so, you know, when I see, you know, one of my former athletes out in public, what's up, coach? And, you know, they've got family with them like that. That's that's the joy for me. Yeah. You know, Um because nobody's going to remember how many points you scored in a game. The one thing that they are going to remember is is the type of person that you were. And how did you treat other people? Yeah. What was the example that you set? And so thankfully, <clears throat> you know, I, I had an opportunity and a chance to grow up a little bit more. And as a result of coaching these guys and, and young ladies that, that I've had the privilege and, and the um, the opportunity to coach that's impacted me because I realize you can't just do anything. Um, being a coach, (laughs) you have to be an example and a role model. Um, you know, one of the, the things that's really important to me in life is, is living authentically. Um, I really desire to be the same person um, in front of you that I am behind closed doors or vice versa. Yeah. Um, most people would argue like everyone doesn't need to see all of you. Um, but you know, I, I question that just because, um, if, if, if I can't show you who I, I genuinely am, um, or I have to feel like I need to hide or mask that then how much of that is genuine yeah you know so um and i'm not there yet <laughs> that, that that that's something that I, I still uh intentionally work at uh just because you know like your character says a lot about who you are um but i think in, integrity speaks to who are you behind closed doors yes you know yeah so yeah so, so you've taken this this found passion. You're developing developing kids, coaching kids, watching them grow up. Yeah. Talk about the the how does the business break down? So, how do you teach and show these things with your company? Absolutely. As you're implementing, right? Because because I'm down here coaching <coughs> kids at jujitsu, right? Monday through Thursday, we've got four to twelve year olds. Yeah. I get to go hang out with you know a couple dozen of them. Beautiful age. You know, and yeah. it's it's an interesting age. And I love yeah. how you mentioned like foster the love. Mm-hmm. just a love for the sport. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you'll see some kids like they're fighting down there. They're fighting mm-hmm. each other and some have grit. Like they come, they come bulldoze head down, yeah. pull in a China shop. Some that takes a little bit of time. It's like, just have fun. Yeah. Just have fun. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you're doing that development mm-hmm. on the court, on the mats. What does your company do? Kind of break that down. So like how does a client engage with you? What is, what does that look like? Yeah. So my performer, uh, we, 
so the way that I categorize us is we are a software analytics network and database. Uh, I call it a sandbox, if you will. Um, and what we do is we focus around post-game performance evaluation that's self-reported from athletes after every game in competition. We do that across 17 sports for college, high school, and club sport teams. And um, essentially what happens is, is that um, after games, players will essentially log in to my Performa um, and they will go through an 11 point, uh, I, we call it a post game review. Tell me how you think you did overall. Uh, what do you think you did well? And what areas do you need to improve? And then lastly, we ask for their hindsight notes, which is really just uh, their own insights and observations about how things just went. Um, and as a result of getting that feedback, uh, it's immediate to their coach. And their coach is able to uh, take that information and, um, harness it and be able to move them along a what what I like to call a continuous path of development as a result of understanding what's their mindset and mind frame around how I just did when you can get that information from athletes it's more impactful to have them sit down and tell me tell you tell me how you think you did i had an experience in 2011 uh, with a, a club team with Rage that I was coaching. And um, I'll never forget, we were winning a game by 10 points. In the last two minutes, we blew that lead. And I can remember calling the last time out, and I was still really, really young and early in my coaching career. And... Hindsight's twenty twenty. So looking back, I think I bled all of my emotions and uncontrolled energy onto them, and that caused them to not be able to essentially pull that game out. And we were at Skyline High School. I remember pulling them out into the lobby in front of their parents, every other athlete, every other spectator and fan, I called them softer than Charmin, soft as a bag of cotton balls, and that they had played like a bunch of Sallies. So aside from my misogynistic overtones, <laughs> and not only that, uh, realizing that I really diminished them in that moment, I learned the valuable and important lesson of asking my players questions as opposed to telling them what I saw. As coaches, we love to tell our teams everything. You did this wrong. You did great here. We didn't do this. Um, we should have done that. Like, why? So what our focus is, is we really have coaches shift their model. Since sports, the dawn of sports, right? I'm sure you can think about it in your own um, playing career. If you've played team sports or even individualized sports, what's the first thing that happens after a game or competition as soon as you pull off the court, the field, or the pool and you go in the locker room? What's the first thing that happens? Yeah, I remember the coach. I, I ran track, so okay. it was individual events, but team, you know, collective, even collective still. team. yeah. Here, here's what we observed. Mm -hmm. right? Here's, here's what we got to work on. Here's mm -hmm. what's next. Yeah. Good job. If it was good. Yeah. It wasn't good. D depended on the coach. Right. right. But yeah, there was, I was never asked, how do you think you did? Mm -hmm. I, I always love shedding this light for coaches because it's almost like an aha moment, right? Whenever we go into the locker room, unfortunately, it's either a lot of empty fist pumping or unnecessary finger wagging. Why on earth would we go into um, uh, wherever our team is at after the game and 
tell them everything that they that we saw. As a coach, yes, our job is to manage the team, right? But we are one person managing however many people, 12 to 15 guys on a team, right? Obviously only five on the court at a time if I'm talking specifically about basketball. So, but there are five other different perspectives on that court that I'm responsible for, you know. So one of the the epiphany and aha moments was I'm not always right. And I miss things a lot. (laughs) It's better for me to go and ask each individual guy or girl, how do you think you did? What do you think you did well? What area do you need to improve? Because then I understand where is their awareness? How self-aware are they? Um, And not only that, then it helps me to be accountable to their perception. Yep. If you're a Christian small business owner and you live in Northern Colorado, you have to check out one of our sponsors, the Foundry Advisory. The Foundry is a Christian executive peer advising group that connects other business owners in the community to help you focus on your faith, your life, your leadership, and your business. Make sure to check them out at thefoundryadvisory.com. If your life or business are cluttered up with junk right now, then you've got to reach out to one of our sponsors, Hulk Addicts Hauling. Hulk Addicts can come out to your home or business to do anything from removing junk to appliances. Maybe you're demoing or doing construction on a property and you need it cleared out. Maybe you need a big dumpster dropped off that they can roll off later. Make sure to check them out at hulkaddictsjunk.com. They are serving all of Northern Colorado as well as up and down the front range. Hey, if you're a business owner and you need to do some renovation in your space or possibly build a building from the ground up, you have to connect with one of our sponsors, Mendel Construction. Mendel Construction is a commercial construction company that's been around since 1997, serving all of Colorado. They can do a small tenant finish all the way up to ground up construction of a new building for your business. Check them out at mendelandcompany.com. That's M-E-N-D-E-L and company. Dot com. So there's this this distinction that we have. Perception comes from within. That's that's my lens looking outward. Perspective comes from without. I'll have to send you this this picture that that illustrates it beautifully. As a coach, my job is to give you perspective. Yes, it's my perception, right? But I'm not the one playing. So I want to hear your perception. Then I'll give you my perspective. Perception here, perspective here. There's a gap that always sits between the two. So how are you bridging that gap as a coach? I see this all the time, whether it's high school or whether it's club. You'll pull off the court and you'll see coaches rip into players. I've I've been there, so I'm not judging it. But... I challenge coaches today that there's a better way to conduct a post game, which is let your players process it for themselves immediately. I want the emotion because a lot of coaches and parents alike always ask me, Justin, shouldn't we give them a few hours to let them calm down? Sports is an emotional game. But if you can teach an athlete how to harness it, as, as a coach, I can, and I, if I know your player or I know that athlete well, or I've, I've developed and built a connection, I can read through the emotion. It's just like you being a parent, right? You can read through the emotion of your child and you can give them a more steady um, uh, feedback on what just occurred. But I can almost guarantee you if you ask them first, all right, I asked you to clean your room. You come back 10, 15 minutes later and, you know, there's still clothes over in the corner and some stuff pushed underneath the bed. And you were to ask them, all right, so I asked you to clean your room. Um, How do you think you did? Let's just look around. Knowing mommy and daddy's standard of cleanliness, right? So we're, we're 
do you yeah. think you could have done a better job? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's the same thing in sports. I don't even have kids yet. Looking forward to that. But when we talk about performance and improvement, it's been scientifically proven. There are case studies upon case study that when you give a person an opportunity to evaluate it for themselves first, for self, by self, yep. not only are you being able, not, not only do you have an opportunity to see like where are they and how far, what's the distance between where they're, they're sitting and where I'm sitting, um, but now you're creating greater self-awareness you're, you're creating accountability between the two of you and you're, you're focusing where you want to go. Yeah. And you've got a clear owned goal and destination mm -hmm. from, from both sides. Mm -hmm. I remember the coaches. Well, here's, here's, you gotta be, and I'm thinking business, you know, business parenting, like you're evaluating a salesperson or how a deal went down. Well, here, like, here's what I expect. I have this imposed expectation that might Absolutely. not even be clear to you. Absolutely. And you're wondering why you didn't hit it. And I'm telling you what I expect mm -hmm. and that you fell short. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, how many times do we miss that in, in business? Yeah. For the, for the business owners, I am awful at uh, quarterly or any time occurrence performance review. Yeah. But like, what do those look like for those that are good at them? Yeah. Well, here's, here's, here's the expectations. Here's mm -hmm. what I see. How do you feel you did? So, I, so I love that. That is a game changer. We just coached. Uh, we had one student participate down at a tournament in Denver. He did, he did really well, but he Love immediately it. pulls him off the mat and there's short time between matches. Yeah. He's fighting the same kid yeah. three times. It's best two out of three. He lost the first match. Yeah. So pulled him off. I mean, I didn't have time to ask him how he did, but I, but I didn't ask him, how do you think you did? Mm -hmm. said, next time go do this. Mm -hmm. You didn't pass the guard, pass the guard. Here's how to pass the guard. And then he did, but, but I've got to go do that. It's, I, I gave it's, him no space to give that feedback. I love that. I, yeah. It creates a shared ownership of the goal. Um, because unfortunately what tends to happen is we bleed all of our bias onto them when we tell them everything that we saw. Yeah. Um, and I always caution players and coaches because it's been proven just with the use of my performa. We've had teams go about their normal way of handling post-game interaction. Hit the locker room. Coach talks to you for 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes. And then we ask them to fill out my performa. And we've seen it happen. Everything that the coach just said in that post-game speech comes right back through what we call the MPI. MPI is called a, is a mindset performance indicator. So similar to a KPI, key performance mm -hmm. indicator, like we see in business and corporate world, um, these are metrics that allow you to understand the performance of an individual. Um, you've probably heard of the concept lead versus lag measures, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So in the instance of basketball, right, <clears throat> your lag measures are going to be your stats. It's all the quantitative information about what just happened in the game. Yep. So this is going to blow, blow your mind for a second, but your lead measure happens after the game. It's what's the mind frame of the athlete because that's really determining how's the next one going to go. So with respect to that, we tell coaches – Give them an opportunity and a chance to self-reflect, self-assess, self-evaluate, because those are going to set you up for your next practice. Yeah, I I have a, a habit now of in in terms of using my performa. Hey, go ahead and knock out your post game. Dap up your teammates. Show some love to your coach. You can get out of here. I don't need to say anything because you've already given me what you thought just occurred. And it takes them three to five minutes after the game. I can go home, go turn on whatever game's on that night, and I have an opportunity to now digest 
everything that each player said. If you, if you as the coach speak first, mm-hmm. the example you just shared, mm-hmm. you said that feedback from the athletes tends to reflect what was put on them. Mm-hmm. Do you notice or do you track differences and responses if there's no post game speech from the coach versus one? But do you, I mean, you're, I'm hearing you say that you think that they'll, they'll lead those answers. Would they be different if it's, you don't say anything? It's untainted. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you, you've heard of, uh, I'm forgetting the term now, but uh, you have more true responses yeah. because they haven't been spoon-fed what you want to hear. Yeah, It's just like the car ride home. Many parents, after kids come out the locker room, and the majority of coaches are giving their post game wrap up speech, so they have that. So the the athletes now feeding the parents what coach just said in the locker room, and then the parents have their perspective and they're feeding their their student athlete um, what they thought about things. No one's asking them. And nobody what asked them first. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to truly get an understanding of the mindset, the mentality, the motivation behind their performance game to game, the unfortunate part about sports present day, and this is my belief purely, is that we are aimlessly coaching athletes to do what we want them to do as opposed to coaching them to be their best selves based upon where their attention is trained. You're not going to tell me your kids. You have one, two, three. 16-year-old son, Riley, and uh, he plays football over at RCS. And uh, 13-year-old daughter, Haley. Love it. Uh, She teaches down on the mats with me. She She loves little kids. Love it. Yeah. So Riley and Haley. Yeah. You're not going to coach or parent Riley the same way you would Haley because they're two separate individual beings, right? Now you have a standard as dad, right? So there's just an expectation level that's the same for both Riley and Haley. Yeah. There's just an expectation. There's a standard. Standard clean, clean room standards are different. I won't share who's got the cleaner room, Okay, but you guys know. If you're watching. <laughs> Fair. I love that though. I love that. So there's this concept in a framework that I use called SEPO. <clears throat> Standards plus expectations plus priorities equal your objectives. So standards are the same across the board. They don't change. I expect my center and my point guard to rebound the exact same way, even if you differ in height. If we're on defense, you're jumping, meeting the ball at its highest point, ripping, and outletting the half court. Love a fast-paced offense, right? If we're on offense, I expect you to meet the ball in the air. You can come down with it, put it straight back up off the glass. I do not want to see it pass back out to the three-point arc. Standard, right? That's a technique standard. Yep. Now, standards can also be the way that you treat each other on the team. We're going to be on time. We're going to be respectful. We're always going to build and encourage great sportsmanship. Um, Those are standards. Those are how we operate in our environment. Expectations differ not only person to person, but as well game to game. You have different expectations of Riley than you do of Haley. So when I think about expectations game to game, my expectations playing, given some local examples, Fossil is going to be different than my expectations playing um, Pooter. Because they could be two different teams in terms of size or speed or whatever the case may be. And then priorities, right? Priorities are always going to differ person to person and as well game to game again. If you're a point guard, I got different priorities for you. If you're a a big, I got different prior. No, a lot of coaches are going to tell me, you know, coach, positionless basketball right now. I I know all that, right? But still, when we talk about teams, we fill and hold different positions and different roles. 
So when you add up your standards plus your expectations plus your priorities, they should lead to your objectives, your end goal. Yeah. That's the framework that we place around um, performance and how to communicate, um, you know, what's expected to each individual and to the team. You know, you got to think for a basketball team, yeah, I have stuff that I want to do as a coach, but all of my players do too. They have their own expectations and priorities. And so it's it's really about how are we bridging that gap and how are we teaching them how to be aligned with the team and to support the team just as much as they're chasing after their own end goal yeah. and objectives. Some kids want to go and play college. Some may even want to go play pro. Some kids may not even want to play after high school. So that's the beauty of a team is how do you get everybody into alignment? And it's a process. And, and my sports, my sports have mostly been individual that, that I've played, but I'm thinking here, as you're, as you're sharing this, I'm thinking of the M and D painting and roofing team, right? Mm -hmm. Or the business partnership. It's the, it's the same thing. Like here's the standards. These are the core values, the things that we, that we run by. They're yeah. ingrained in the company. Here's what we expect yeah. in this engagement. And then everybody's got their role. Right. And they're, yeah. they're different roles. But, Absolutely. You know, we've got we've got different perspectives, like on the sales standpoint right now. Mm -hmm. We're growing. Our company's growing quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the gentlemen here, he's like, man, I want to get out of selling and really grow into a bigger integrator role. Mm. Got another guy. He's like, man, I like I like it. Like life's good. I like the, the volume, mm -hmm. the quantity, mm -hmm. the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Got another guy that's getting ready to come in here. He's like, I want to break every record. And then it matters for him for a certain reason, just as much as it matters for, for the other guy. And it's like that all builds towards the common, absolutely the common goal. Yeah. And you, know, you can't compare one to the other like uh, values. You all got to be honest and absolutely. accountable and respectful yeah. and kind and loving and do the right thing. That That's central to the, yes. the core of the culture, yeah, I right? Love that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I really think, you know, with this, the, the, with the evolution in the landscape of sports, it's shifted. We were talking about this earlier. In the day and age of the transfer portal, NIL opportunities, um, and the very nature of the modern athlete, this generation has to deal with a lot more than what we ever had to. We didn't grow up with social media. But if you can imagine, I'll even give this example. At the pro level, you see it. Players can play the first half, go in the locker room, pull out their phone, check Instagram and Twitter, and, and see the pulse of what fans or their detractors are saying. Yeah. So... And I can only imagine for you being a parent in the day and age of social media, how you have to guard and protect and nurture your child in a certain, your children in a certain way to where you say, hey, block that out. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's noise. But they, they grow up with this thousand dollar device in their pocket and have access to the world. To all the noise. Yeah, we didn't grow to up with all that. of it. And coaching is more so about being able to hear and understand what's the inner voice of a particular person. When, as a coach, your relationships become so much more strengthened and stronger when you're able to direct the voice positively of, of those individuals purely based upon like how do they view themselves. I'll give you a case in point, point instance. I will have players that are probably some of the more talented athletes on teams beat themselves up the most with their post game. And some of the athletes that aren't as talented athletically or gifted think they did a bang up job. So it's a matter of being able to know 
and judge the balance of criticism and encouragement. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. Coaches for ages, some of the great coaches that I look at, you know, I, I glean from Wooden and uh, Calipari, uh, Bayheim. You know, these are guys that have done it, you know, maybe at the collegiate level, even when I think at the pro level, Phil Jackson, you know, coach some really great athletes and their experience has taught them how to motivate players. But as we're shifting into, uh, we are in a newer age of sports and coaching and we really have to be able to understand the, the wavelength of that particular indiv individual to know how can I motivate them better. Am I saying that my performance is the end-all, be-all for, for helping improve sports performance? No. But I really do think it impacts it when you look at it from the perspective of how can I take this individual and really nurture them to become their greatest self. Athletes all need different things. They, they accept criticism differently. Um, they need different amounts of encouragement. But you can't really know and understand that dosage or how to crank up the, the knob or the lever or turn it down a bit unless you dive into their minds. You know, one of my, my co-founders, uh, George, is, is famous. He, he's always reminding me, train the mind and the body will follow. Um, we, as coaches, can do a much better job of inquiring with our athletes before we speak. What do you think? So that's the essence of my performa. You've shared so so much insight, right? And as you're talking about sports through that lens, through that background, I mean, people that are tuning into this, business owners, business leaders, right? Parents, Absolutely. people of influence that that have authority and impact in places to speak into other people's life, right? Like how, how cool is that? Like how many times do we place our opinion through our lens and our perspective on them yeah. and, and don't even ask? So you shared tons of wisdom. Hmm. We are going to wrap up and we wrap up the podcast all the podcasts same way you yeah. grabbed favorite color off the wall yeah and uh, you're going to share your statement that you're going to leave with the world when you leave it with us yeah absolutely. what do you got um <clears throat> i this was on my heart just because this was something that i've been chewing on this morning uh in my personal time uh so i'll leave you with a verse uh scripture verse first corinthians fifteen ten. um and the whole thing's not on here, but uh, you'll, you'll get the gist of it, and you can go back and read it for reference. But it says here, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace which has bestowed upon me was not in vain. Um, and there's a little bit more to that verse, but, um, you know, I, as I sit and, you know, I'm reflecting just even with where we are present day, um, <laughs> I didn't get here alone, <laughs> both from the man above and the, the community, the people, my team that I have around me. And um, I think with anything big or with any big vision or dream, um, the bigger that is, the the bigger the team you need around you. So, Absolutely. Um, and as we're sitting here talking about team and performance, um, it's important to know where your team sits. So the more perspective um, that you can gain. Um, I think of a quote uh, by a guy named Inky Johnson. He says, uh, perspective drives performance every single day of the week. How you view what you do will always impact how you do what you do. Uh, so the more we can uh, continue to, to gain perspective uh, for ourselves and, and from others, um, I think that's where uh, transformation occurs. Yeah. Man, thank you so much Absolutely. for being here. Hey, appreciate you. Appreciate That's a wrap. You, hey, thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Would you make sure to please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel here? And please share this episode with somebody whose life it will make better. 
I would be extremely grateful if you would go to mattshop.com and click on the free tools and download those. On my website, you'll find that I've got some things for you wherever you are on your journey in life, leadership, and business. Start with those free tools. Maybe next, check out a couple of my books, my video coaching series, or maybe consider even coming to spend a week with me in Spain on one of my leadership adventures.